what do they do in the social situations? Uh, that's the real hard part of eating this way is is being different from everyone else. And again, for some, some teenagers, that's an opportunity for them to declare their identity. And for some teenagers, uh, that could be horrifying. Uh, uh, you know, just bringing a, a brown bag lunch to the school cafeteria uh, is you know, horrifying. Uh, so it really depends. Uh, but that's what I'm trying to really support them in being in being different. Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dotsie and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page, that's Switch, the number four, and then Good, and then click on Groups. And there we are, the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group and tell us what you want. With childhood obesity reaching epidemic proportions, our guest today, Dr. Lee Edinger, aka Dr. Herbivore, is a pediatric nephrologist who has seen firsthand the benefits of a plant-based diet for children. Dr. Edinger is board certified in general pediatrics and received his medical degree from Tufts University. He also received a certificate in plant-based nutrition from E. Cornell in 2016. And in 2019, he became a diplomat of the American Board of Obesity Medicine. He has a telemedicine practice in New York and New Jersey, where he encourages a plant-centric diet and empowers families to embrace a healthier lifestyle. In a world where children spend more time in front of computers and significantly less time in nature, it's an honor to have him here with us today so we can pick his brain. So welcome, Dr. Edinger. Thank you so much, Dotsy and Alexandra. Thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to this talk. Well, we are too. So we first got to know you really from social media and and, and you and our wonderful director of education, Tiffany, uh, batted back and forth a whole bunch of science and bad science by dairy and, and et cetera, et cetera, on, on email. But uh, it's, it's, it's really cool to, to have you on. We've, we have had, I think, only one um, uh, pediatric doctor on really in, in the history of over 200 episodes. So this, this is exciting. And one of the first questions I have is pretty simple, but it's very interesting, interesting you call yourself a herbivore. And why do you prefer that term over vegan or plant-based? Oh, that's interesting. Yes. So um, for one, I wanted to attract families that already uh, were expecting to talk about the plant-based diet. When I was working for three years in a hospital-based pediatric weight management program, families would come in and I'd say, hey, have you ever considered the plant-based diet? And they'd look at me so confused, so quizzically. Uh, so there was an, that initial hurdle to get over. So as I set up my own practice, trying to support families who are struggling with obesity, that uh, I thought I'd put some kind of indication in the name to let them know as they were coming in what to expect. And I really, I kind of prefer the name herbivore over vegan because it kind of reminds me that uh, I'm on this planet, I'm in the ecosystem, I'm eating plants, and it kind of is a more meaningful word to me that than a vegan per se. I know vegan is very powerful and very meaningful, but uh, as a herbivore, uh, I don't want to eat other animals. And as a herbivore, I'm also kind of worried about being the prey of something else. And historically, that might have been the saber-toothed tiger. But nowadays, the things that are attacking us are obesity, our heart disease, our uh, diabetes, and things like that. So I'm thinking more like an herbivore as I'm eating, and that's helping me avoid that prey. You began your practice as a pediatric nephrologist uh, about 20 years ago. And then you, it was only later that you had a revelation that maybe diet was an important um, uh, part of your practice. 
first tell us what pediatric nephrology is for, for those who don't know. And then what were you seeing in your patients that made you uh, realize that something was very wrong in the health of Americans and made you, uh, you know, sort of expand your practice to obesity, especially in children? Sure. Yeah. So I had a long interest in hypertension. I actually did an 11th grade science project that on hypertension on my, my classmates <laughs> that actually won fourth place in the local science fair. And I got a $5 prize, which I promptly spent uh, at a fast food restaurant on the way home. <laughs> um, so not really making the connection between uh, diet and blood pressure yet. But uh, I went uh, into medical school. I went into uh, pediatrics with the intention of helping address pediatric hypertension. I thought that was very interesting and very um, uh, would be very uh, professionally satisfying to me. And uh, however, I learned uh, a lot of people think high blood pressure, they think about the heart. And I actually did some research in uh, medical school with a pediatric cardiologist. But uh, then I started to figure out that, and others uh, know that uh, pediatric hypertension is often due to a kidney problem. And I had a good mentor in residency, in the pediatric residency. So I was already learning how to be a pediatrician. And the pediatric nephrologist that I was working with really made the nephrology very interesting, very exciting, and it really stuck with me. And uh, actually, so there, there are two ways I needed, I know I wanted to go into pediatric nephrology is that uh, when I was really exhausted after a 36 hour shift, I uh, could stay awake reading pediatric nephrology journal articles, uh, and I could also stay awake reading cycling. And uh, I'm a cycling enthusiast, so it's a real honor to speak to an Olympian like Dotsie too. Um, but uh, I really enjoy cycling. Cycling could keep me awake and pediatric nephrology could keep me awake after those long shifts. So I thought that's where I should go. So I went into pediatric nephrology and in uh, the major medical center where I was working, local pediatricians, if they were concerned about kidney, uh, if they were concerned about high blood pressure for their patients, then they would send them to me because often in the pediatric age group, it can be a sign of kidney disease. And so I would rule out a kidney problem. I would rule out a heart problem. I would rule out a hormone problem. And then I'd be sitting there with families uh, where uh, the child had a body mass index of 35. They were obese. And I'd start to talk to them. I'd always known about the salt. I'd always known, uh, not when I was in 11th grade, but as I went through my training, I always learned and knew about the salt connection. Uh, but it wasn't later that I started to make the other connections with uh, diet that uh, I was able to help actually start to get families off of blood pressure medicines with dietary changes and losing weight even also. So that was very satisfying to me. Okay. Why are we seeing this epidemic of obesity in children? I A lot of us can make certain inferences and guesses, right? The children are inside more and we have a, a, a pretty gnarly processed food system uh, that, that is, is feeding them. What are you seeing when families come in upset that their, their kid is sick and I'm assuming starting to have some kidney issues from being obese, that's why they're coming to see you. What are they saying? What are their cries about uh, as it relates to their children. Right. It can be very frustrating. Um, it's just a, we're in a tough situation. Uh, first, I try to explain to them that obesity is nobody's fault. We're in a situation of an evolutionary mismatch in that Homo sapiens has been around on the planet for 200, 250,000 years. And for most of those times, calories are very scarce. So our reward centers are set up to help us find food, all of our senses, to help us find food and remember where food was. And uh, we would get rewards in our brains, uh, the pleasure centers when we found food because it meant we were gonna survive another day. Uh, now we're such a successful species that calories are easily available, but we have the same reward centers and that same situation where we think we're doing the right thing by eating the high calorie food, the high salt, the high fat, high sugar content food, but unfortunately now it's become problematic. And instead of helping with our survival, those high salt, high sugar, high fat foods are contributing to sickness and making us obese and hypertensive and diabetic. But the tough situation that we're in is our brain still thinks we're making the right choices. And that's what I'm trying to help families understand is it's time to, to try to make 
better choices for our bodies. And you recommend a plant-based diet for your patients um, who are kids. So a lot of people are worried. They're okay with adults, sort of, having a plant-based diet. But when it comes to raising babies or kids or even teenagers vegan, the parents and adults get very nervous. Please tell us why they shouldn't be worried about um, putting their children, uh, offspring, on a plant-based diet and what those benefits are for them. Right. Uh, parents are concerned. Also, my colleagues were concerned. Uh, and uh, so I really did a deep dive into the literature to try to understand, uh, because the first day of medical school, they teach us primum non nocere, first do no harm. So I didn't want to be doing anything that would potentially put my patients in risk and danger. So I really uh, went out and tried to educate myself. I got the board certified in obesity medicine. I took the E. Cornell class. And I read all the books and watched all the documentaries, and I really tried to immerse myself and understand all this so that I could first be doing no harm. And I'm really reassured by the literature out there. So, so unfortunately, there's not a lot of studies about it in kids, and often they are in other countries or uh, the plant-based diet has just changed so much recently with now we have plant-based ice cream and plant-based burgers and things like that. So even uh, looking at a study from the 90s on a, on a family or kids that are being raised vegan, it, it just, uh, it's just like comparing apples and oranges. So it can be very difficult. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm still confident, I'm reassured that it is the right thing to do for the family and all of the uh, other external implications like the environment and the animal welfare issues and the social justice issues that you talk about on this uh, podcast. So um, I try to be very reassuring and educate the family and, and address their concerns. And also, uh, since these are patients that are referred to me, uh, the, the pediatrician's concerns, you know, they, they sent the patient to me with a high blood pressure and I'm talking about broccoli. It's like, uh, <laughs> uh, what's going on here? So, so what are their specific, how do you, if you could give us some tang, like be the voice of some of your patient, your patient's parents and what you say to them when they say, well, they need milk for strong bones or how am I going to get the iron? Uh, that kind of thing. Right, right. So, oh, yes, that's a, a lot of a lot of questions uh, that I try to address with the science and with uh, the studies that have been done and uh, which is the stories that are out there, for uh, example. So, you know, they say we need milk. But uh, uh, again, I go back to evolutionary history that you know, Homo sapiens has been around for 200, 250,000 years. And we've only domesticated cows and goats for the past maybe 10, 12,000 years. So again, for 99% of our time on this planet, we didn't have dairy to drink. And actually the record shows that the Neanderthal and the, the Homo erectus, all their bones are actually stronger than ours, probably because they were more physically active than us. Uh, so if you're, you know, they weren't drinking dairy necessarily. And then I like to tell a story about when I was with my daughter in an Asian restaurant and, uh, uh, a dish came out and I thought it had yogurt on it. I was like, oh, you know, what is this? Is this yogurt? And the waiter was like, no, 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 no dairy. There's there's no dairy in our dishes. My country is lactose intolerant. We we don't have dairy in our menu on our dishes. And so I'm thinking, you know, there are whole countries in Asia and Africa where the pediatricians actually tell the families, don't drink dairy. It'll make your child sick. It'll give them upset stomach and diarrhea. Uh, so, you know, why, why do we feel the need to... In, you know, encourage dairy in this country, um, especially when we're such a diverse patient, pop, diverse uh, population. You were explaining uh, why we are seeing uh, so much obesity and, and, the, and the difference between, like you said, 200, 250,000 years ago and, and, and today, right? We don't have to go foraging for food and, and you know, use up 3,000 calories just looking for, a, you know, a bunch of, of, of berries. Um, but there's, there's, I think it's just almost across the board that so many people think that their body composition itself, whether it's overweight or underweight, is, is directly due to their specific genes. Are there any genes or variants that can cause obesity? How common is that? Or, or is it not really common at all? And it's just so much more what you were sharing with us at the beginning of this podcast of why we're obese. Right. Um, there actually are 70 known, 79 known genes that can cause child obesity, and they can be easily detected with a cheek swab genetic test 
that you put in the mail. Uh, so when the indications for doing that, though, is often if there's concerns about a syndrome. So those genetic causes of uh, kidney, uh, I'm sorry, of obesity uh, will also often have uh, some kind of developmental delay or learning issues and sometimes a classic syndromic appearance. So it's not like every child that has obesity gets a genetic test, but if there's the obesity with another indication, uh, then you can pursue the genetic testing. And if so, then they can uh, go into a more of a genetic program that can address the various facets of the genetic disorder. But um, those are very rare. It's thought just a few percentage of the, uh, the child obesity problem. Often those kids with the um, genetic form of obesity are ravenously hungry all the time. It's just that they, uh, they don't have the, that turn off switch for satiety. Uh, so these are the kind of kids that are raiding the fridge in the middle of the night and they just are hungry all the time. Yeah, 79 sounds like a lot, but, but, but you're saying it's, it really yeah. is only uh, shown in one or 2%. Yeah, yeah, there are lots of, there, it's maybe one uh, particular gene defect, but there's 79 variations. There's a lot of different variations. It's not that there's so many different kinds. It's just uh, the, the known defects in these few particular genes that mostly regulate our feeling of satiety. Um, and like I said, it usually goes along with some other physical or learning problems, uh, physical findings on exam, that kind of thing. The CDC says that the percentage of Americans over the age of 20, and so adult Americans who are overweight or obese, is over 73%. So it's almost three quarters of our population. Uh, actually, that was five years ago. Yeah. So it's probably maybe even higher today. Um, as a pediatric that was obesity before the pandemic, specialist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, so as a pediatric obesity specialist, what are the stats with Americans under 20? terms of obesity and I overweight? A, I think it's one in five, one in six at this point. Um, and some populations like African-Americans, Hispanic-Americans are, um, are having higher percentages. So it's very common. It plateaued in some age groups uh, through like the 2010 through 2020. There seemed to be a plateau. But again, the pandemic was a major setback for this epidemic. It's the, the first epidemic of obesity and childhood obesity. So uh, early data from what's been going on recently shows that the obesity epidemic is worsening. Okay. Wait, are, are other countries having the same problem? And which countries are not? Yes. And do they have what you would consider to be optimum diets or does it have nothing to do with that? I know that in the Middle East, um, it's they're having a, a major problem with obesity. Um, actually, one of my patients uh, went to Egypt. Uh, he was uh, maybe 12 or 13 uh, specifically to get bariatric surgery because they were doing it so often in Egypt. Mm. And I looked into it, and apparently the Middle East is suffering with a lot of childhood obesity. Um, What's the difference between overweight and obese? Right, so overweight in, for an adult would be a body mass index of 25 to 30, and obese would be above 30. However, for children, since they're gaining, the, the body mass index is a measure of your height and your weight, but their height is changing also. So uh, for children, it's looking at uh, greater than 85th percentile for their age of body mass index is considered overweight and greater than 90th percentile is considered obese. So for some children, for the younger children, for example, um, you don't necessarily need to encourage weight loss. You just kind of want them to maintain their weight as they're growing taller, and that will help them lean out and have their body mass index normalize over the years that they're gaining height. So we don't necessarily need to encourage a lot of weight loss in the younger children, uh, especially because that can impact other other things like growth and puberty and things like that. So sometimes uh, the goal is just to maintain weight so that they can grow into it. When you have a, f a family that comes in and their, their, their child is obese, I mean, there's, I can only imagine how many layers of scenarios are, you know, at play there. Um, but as it relates to, to, to food and diet, I mean, what are some of those first steps, I, especially if the child is having 
fast food three times a day because the, the, the parents are working and extremely busy and just, you know, making ends meet. So that's just the easiest, most efficient way to uh, feed, feed them. It, it, you know, having a diet like that, that's pretty hard to say, okay, right. We're going to have, you know, whole grain toast and broccoli and avocado for breakfast now. And, you know, I, I and, and kids are, you know, they're so impressionable. They're hanging out with their friends and they, you know, want to be able to fit in. T- take, take us on a, on a, on a typical journey of, of what are some of the first things you say to parents and how do you keep them, how do you keep them encouraged? Uh, and, and what kind of changes do you suggest first? Right. This is the big challenge in pediatrics. We're dealing with the whole family. And often I'm trying to first get a sense of who's feeding the child, who's purchasing food, who's preparing food. Um, is the child with one parent on the weekends? Is a grandparent or even nanny the one making dinners? Like you said, everyone's coming and going all the time. So it's important to figure out who's actually feeding the child and the younger children also. And then for the older kids, uh, if they might have their own transportation or their own money and they're going out and buying and uh, stopping at the corner store or the fast food restaurant. So yeah, I'm trying to get a sense of all the comings and goings, but I really want to get a sense also of the motivation and what's the real cue. To, I try to explore the cue to action. So uh, what is the cause that is going to motivate the person? So my most successful cases were the families that came in with a real concern. Uh, about something. Uh, For example, uh, one good success I had was with a young man who came in with high blood pressure and he had obesity. And he actually came to me for a second opinion. He was already on a blood pressure medicine. And um, I started to talk to him about diet and I uh, brought up the plant-based diet. And uh, he said, you know, my uncle uh, just saw his cardiologist and was told that he had unoperable heart disease and that he really needed to stop eating meat. And so uh, that was like an in. Uh, So this young man kind of put it together and he became the poster child for plant-based nutrition. And he lost 60 pounds. He came off his blood pressure medicine that had been prescribed by another doctor. So if I can find some kind of cue to, I call that a cue to action. That's uh, someone's either going to have some internal motivation, like it might be a new diagnosis, like hypertension or diabetes, or it can be an external motivation, like a family member who had a health problem, or even a celebrity. You know, sometimes you get, uh, if a celebrity is diagnosed with cancer or colon, uh, breast cancer or colon cancer, that can bring people into the doctors with, with some concern. So you kind of want to find out what's bringing them there. And then also what they're I I go through this system called the health belief model. So it's the cue to action. And then it's uh, figuring out what their perceived uh, benefits are. It's like, okay, so if you make this change, uh, what's going to get better? And for the kids, it's kind of interesting. So, you know, you might have, I had one young girl who said, you know, I would really like to uh, not get diabetes like my aunt. That was her cue to action. That was her her, uh, concern. But the benefit that she was looking forward to was really looking great in her prom dress. You know, that so they, it wasn't connected, but that uh-huh. that was you find out what they're afraid of and what the what the goal is. And then once I understand their um, their concerns and their goals is understanding their perceived barriers. So it's like, OK, and I reflect back to them, like, OK, like, let's let's not get the diabetes like the aunt and let's look great in our prom. Uh, how are we going to get there? And then it's uh, basically all the excuses that come up uh, at that point, like, oh, the Plant, you know, plant-based eating is so expensive or, oh, the gym's so far away. So then then once I try to understand what the barriers are uh, or, you know, grandma's grandma's house is always cookies. You know, once I can understand what the barriers are and, again, reflecting back what where they're trying to escape from and where they're trying to go, uh, then I can hopefully brainstorm with them uh, so that we can come up with a plan. And then hopefully getting them to, to stick to the plan. But I don't recommend motivation because motivation is a fleeting human emotion. Mm. Uh, what I really try to encourage is a discipline. So I, I kind of use the example of brushing your teeth. Like, um, pe- you know, nobody's motivated to brush their teeth every day. It's just something that we kind of do because we're disciplined. Uh, and that discipline is rewarded after several decades. You have a nice smile, low dental bills, things like that. So I try to encourage someone to think about their dietary and lifestyle changes like that. The reward comes at the end. Uh, the reward comes in a year. Uh, the reward comes when you're at your prom. Uh, 
not uh, to be motiv- motivated is going to fail you. Motivation is not going to get you through the day necessarily. But if you can come up with, if we can together come up with a plan and you can um, be disciplined about it, then I would hope that you would achieve that goal. I will help you achieve that goal. It can be tough with families dealing with kids who are overweight because there's, uh, when it becomes about dieting, there's that pressure to diet or eat less food or eat certain foods. It's easy to shame a young person at, or even create an eating disorder or secret eating and things like that. How do you deal with that to try and keep it as positive an experience as possible for everybody? Right. So this is one of the benefits of the plant-based diet versus other diets that encourage portion control or moderation is that I try to crowd out. So by having the people fill up on whole plants, then they're not hungry. They don't hopefully feel the need to eat in secret or they're not reaching uh, with a craving for something if they're filling up on uh, uh, encouraged starches. I'm a big fan of Dr. McDougall's starch solution. So I'm potatoes and uh, bananas, especially. I had I had one dad call me up once. Uh, he wasn't in the visit. Um, and he called me up like a week after I'd seen the teenage boy. And he's like, what are you doing? Why is my son eating all these bananas? He's eating seven bananas a day. I'm like, oh, oh really? That's great. How's you know, what's your concern? It's like, it seems like a lot of bananas. What's he doing with all those bananas? I'm like, well, how's he doing? He's like, well, he lost 10 pounds. <laughs> Like, all right, so maybe you should eat more bananas. You know, it's like it was it was probably water weight. It was, you know, nothing big. But uh, you can see that uh, being full on those uh, low, lower calorie, high fiber water content foods can really be satisfying. And then I would hope that uh, the person wouldn't be dealing with those other issues and cravings and and uh, sneaking food and things like that. Just eat a banana. And I like I like bananas too. So um, bananas are great because they can go out, they can go out, they can be on the shelf, right? In the kitchen. So as soon as you walk in the kitchen, it can be the first thing you see before you go rummaging through the pantry or something. So I really, I encourage bananas. Yeah. We're, we're potato gals here. So yes, we, we feel <laughs> and potatoes, the, yes, the, yeah. The, yeah, they're so satiating. They, they take a few minutes to cook. Yeah, they do. Yeah. You kind of, yeah. Yeah. Got it down pretty well, but yes, it's, it's not as quick as a banana. Is there an, an optimum like age or time of life to, to, to make a, a change, let's say it, well, let's say under, under 15, you know, I mean, in, in that range, like, is it, is it better if they come like right when they start eating food, I, I guess, cause then, then, then they don't know anything else. So that I answered my own question there, but, but after they've, they've been eating some junk, like it, it, before they get in school or not, or does it, have you noticed any kind of trends um, in, in order to hopefully make the change permanent, what's kind of the optimum ideal uh, age and scenario? Yeah, so the problems of diabetes and hypertension and obesity develop over decades. Um, so we don't, we see some of the, we're starting to see in kids the diabetes and the hypertension from obesity. Uh, so it, it's almost, it's almost uh, sneaking up on people. And so I think the sooner, the better. And, uh, and it, really what we eat is based on our habits. So I think the sooner you can establish those habits, the, the better also. Although, you know, I, I heard a pediatrician once say something funny. Uh, you know, the, the, I, was, uh, I was a student, I was in residency at the time, and uh, the mom was asking like, oh, you know, do, I, do I encourage for her infant, uh, do I encourage fruits or vegetables or what's, what's the order? I want my child to eat healthy and stuff like that. And, and the pediatrician was like, uh, it doesn't matter. As soon as the kid turns one and has cake and ice cream, it's over. <laughs> so it's like, um, you know, just our, the, our society. But uh, with all the, the sweets and the treats that are available. But I think as, if you can try to encourage the younger people to kind of get into better habits, then that can help them stick. And again, another reason why I really like the plant-based diet is because it really draws a line and uh, a person uh, might be motivated for reasons other than than just health and nutrition. I still think that it's difficult you know, I, for a 15 year old to understand what it's like to be 50. I mean, I, I just turned 50. I'm still trying to figure out what it's like to be 50. Um, so to explain, to, to have a have a 15 year old be like, 
I want to make this decision because uh, of how I'm going to be when I'm 50. It's like, well, no, some that they might want to make the decision because of the environment um, or for animal welfare. So having some something that's more real or an influencer, you know, uh, a famous actor, a musician, or a sports figure that's made this decision, and and uh, so I think the teenagers and the younger people can can really latch on to that aspect rather than their blood pressure or or even their weight. You know, I talked to some some people that are, you know, young people that are 250 pounds, but they're the thinnest out of their whole family and their friends. So they don't necessarily even see the problem, uh, but they're learning about the environment. Uh, I had one young woman who was spending her weekends uh, with a community group cleaning up the parks. I said, oh, you know, so I'm glad to hear you're interested in the environment. That, that's great that you're acting locally. Let's talk about like some global issues and, and our food choices and things like that. So I really try to figure out what can help a person um, besides just focusing on the weight or the numbers or the blood pressure. Uh, the beauty of the plant-based diet is it has, gives all these other benefits. And, uh, and, for, and for some teenagers, it's just a rebellion. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, uh, some teenagers go out and smoke or some teenagers... Uh, fight with their parents or some just won't eat what their parents are serving. Uh, so in, in another way, even as the teenagers are developing their own identity, uh, this is a way that they can uh, develop an ad- identity, something that they mm-hmm. identify with and help, uh, help them uh, define themselves. There's a lot of messaging now about how you can be fat and healthy, uh, overweight and healthy and um, I'm sure we might even get pushback for focusing so much on obesity in children. The argument might be it's not unhealthy for them, uh, et cetera. What do you say to the um, you can be healthy and fat uh, argument? Right. So there are two studies uh, that one showed it was uh, looking at uh, already toddlers and three-year-olds who are overweight and 80% of them were still overweight or obese uh, at, when they were 18. And then there was another study that looked at 18-year-olds uh, who were overweight and obese, and like 90, 95% of them were still overweight or obese as 30-year-olds. Um, and if you think about it, those studies were done 20 years ago, or they started 20 years ago, uh, and the obesity epidemic has worsened. So you know, to the, someone to say, oh, the, the kids will just grow out of it, um, there seems to be studies that that's not going to happen. Um, and then, yes, certainly I, I do meet families and I do meet young people who classify by their body mass index as obese, but their blood sugars are totally normal. Their blood pressure is totally normal. Their lipids are totally normal. Everything about them, they are considered metabolically healthy. And uh, sure, that's great and good for them. Uh, and I applaud that, that but with these problems that can develop over time, uh, it just seems like that the um, I did see a, a study that these meta they're called, they're called what was the acronym is like uh, metabolically healthy obese like M H O something like that if I remember so metabolically healthy obese um, who ultimately have do have a higher risk of uh, developing. Uh, the lipid problems, the the uh, blood pressure problems, the diabetes, uh, greater than the general population over the years and decades, um, and then also even though you know their cholesterol might be normal, this m- like might be normal, that might be normal. I still worry about their epigenetic phenomenon, which is that there are genes that are being turned on and turned off uh, because of their obesity that uh, can lead to more inflammatory states. Uh, and again, increasing the risk of disease above and beyond the general population. So I do worry. And then there, there is another issue that I did learn about as I was researching that very question, and that is um, motor vehicle collisions. So you, if you think about the greatest uh, chance of someone dying in the teenage age group is some kind of accident. You know, the most risky thing we do um, uh, every day is hurtle down the highway uh, in our car. And um, the G-forces uh, that occur during accident are um, many multiples of your mass. So someone, you know, you think about someone carrying around extra mass, 
uh, and that just increases the risk. And there have been studies that shown that uh, people with obesity uh, get into much worse uh, injuries in motor vehicle collisions. Um, and then uh, people with obesity in the hospital also have a higher morbidity and mortality rate. So it's like, it's, uh, it, it's concerning. And then also, um, oh, um, oh, well, just going back to the, the, uh, the automobile thing is that uh, people with the um, crash test dummies that are used for testing, um, are, uh, they, they only recently started using larger framed crash test dummies. But the concern is that the restraining seatbelt uh, doesn't sit properly to properly restrain someone with obesity, or um, they, uh, the person with obesity feels too constricted and too uncomfortable with the seatbelt on, so they don't wear the seatbelt. Uh, just because it's too uncomfortable. So there are, um, you, uh, this is like a public service announcement, but you can contact the vehicle manufacturer and you can get a seatbelt extender uh, if your seatbelt is like on the airplane, they have those, um, but the vehicle manufacturers, uh, and it's like, don't try to make yeah. your own. Uh, that's not necessarily safe, but if you're not wearing your seatbelt because it's too uncomfortable with your obesity, then I suggest trying to get one of these seatbelt extenders and that can help protect you in the event of a collision. Um, and then your question is like, why, why are people with obesity uh, at greater, they're at greater risk for infections and surgical complications in the hospital. So and this is because um, their all of that plays into, now? right, yeah, their inflammatory state and uh, circulation sometimes. And um, even sometimes like the dosing of antibiotics can be difficult with someone who has a, um, a lot of uh, body fat, for example, mm -hmm. um, whether the antibiotic is fat soluble or water soluble. So uh, it can be, it can be tricky. So mm -hmm. um, yeah. So uh, while I might be sitting there with someone who's metabolically healthy, um, there are still things that uh, as physicians we can do and suggest again, first do no harm, um, but try and help someone uh, appreciate the added risks. And then in the, it's just going on and on, but the, the mental health issues and that, um, you know, that people with obesity are often struggling um, with their, their mental health because of the obesity, just because of the society we're in. So um, that's, a, that's a sensitive issue that uh, I try to help families with too, or at least get them into the right uh, services for that. And joints, of course, that's a big issue. Um, yeah, you have a lot of weight on your on your joints, and that can really make it really difficult to even walk later in life if uh, if you've been putting so much weight on your knees, for example, or ankles. Yes, yes, uh, and again, the 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 G forces. So um, people with obesity have stronger bones, uh, just by virtue of having that frame having to hold up more weight, but uh, the studies show that actually even teenagers um, with obesity have a greater risk of, of arm fractures uh, because even though they have stronger bones, when they fall, the greater G-forces of their body weight on their, on their bones uh, increases their risk of fracture. So uh, again, the, when I'm thinking and looking at someone who's metabolically healthy based on their blood test, there are these other risk factors that go along with obesity that that still um, make it uh, make it itself a risk factor for other problems. So if you have somebody that is um, by the numbers obese, but are very metabolically he healthy, like you mentioned before, good blood pressure and um, good, you know, good glu glucose levels, et cetera, is there, are there studies that show that the weight alone would possibly lead to them becoming metabolically unhealthy later in life? Right. Well, uh, the um, what's been shown is that even though someone might have a normal blood sugar, if uh, it's been plotted over time, you see a fasting blood sugar creeping up over the years and over the decades until diabetes is finally diagnosed. So um, that's been seen. So that even though... Um, if I look at their blood test and it's normal, uh, if I actually go back and look year over year over year, and again, this is more in the adult population, but you can start to actually see a trend. And the same with the blood pressure. These uh, 
these numbers are on a continuum and sometimes the trend can be missed and it's due to the inflammatory process and due to the accumulation of fat in the muscles and in the liver uh, that can ultimately lead to diabetes and yeah we just worry about these issues over time that even though you might be looking at a number you want to look at the trend also a normal number uh, that's worse than last year. It's still normal, but it's trending in the wrong direction. It can be a concern. If you mentioned that um, if a child is uh, overweight at 18, they're very, very likely to be overweight decades later. So if a child puts on adipose mm -hmm. tissue in childhood, does that make it harder to lose weight than an adult who might gain weight in their 30s or 40s? Um, or is it all the same? Because I know it's hard to lose weight once you've gained it. Yeah, I think that, that maybe that has been the impression in the past, but the, the newer bariatric surgeries where people will lose tremendous amounts of weight in just a few months uh, show that it is possible to, to shrink down those fat cells. Um, you know, the, the bariatric surgery is being perfected and, uh, is much less risky than maybe it has been historically. And uh, for better or for worse, it's been shown to be very effective in causing a, a drastic weight losses. So, um, you know, whether that was recently gained weight or uh, a lifetime of weight that was gained, uh, I think either way, the, the bariatric surgery has been shown to be very effective. And in 2019, actually, the American Academy of Pediatrics was encouraged, started to, made a guidelines to encourage that uh, uh, pediatricians start to consider bariatric surgery for teenagers with, that are uh, extremely obese, severely obese. And so that's starting to happen too. I was curious as how important you think it is uh, for someone of any age who's going to have bariatric surgery to also have um, uh, psychological counseling. And I'm asking because I have a good friend who had bariatric surgery and has uh, you know, lost a ton of weight because your stomach is so tiny. You can barely eat. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll watch her eat food that's not even any bigger than like the palm of my hand and it, she's stuffed. Right. So you, but over time, and she says this because of her food addiction, she would literally go through excruciating pain as she's stretching back out her stomach. And she told me it feels like there is food coming up and out of her esophagus and into her mouth. Like it's so uncomfortable when she overeats, uh, you know, in relation to the size of her stomach, but because of the food addiction, there, there was no stopping her. And now she's almost the, the same size that she was. And I learned through her that there are some insurance companies that they go hand in hand. They won't, uh, say yes to the bariatric pain for the bariatric surgery unless there's psychological counseling. I, I just, I just that 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 one example alone made me think about all the scenarios that you must see if if someone wants to get bariatric, bariatric surgery done. And but what about the addiction? Right. Uh, yes, uh, that is an important part of it. Mostly. Uh, to assess the person, make sure they have a very realistic understanding of the risks and the benefits and also the expectations um, of what's going to happen. And yes, uh, but what I, as you mentioned, I, I don't I don't know. I haven't seen um, a lot of emphasis on uh, changing someone's nutrition. Um, so, yeah, a lot of people. It's been now that bariatric surgery has been around for a few years and decades, and people are starting to put the weight back on despite the small stomach. And like you said, maybe it's uh, the mental health issues. Maybe this they have some other issues that they're dealing with, or the um, the compulsions or things like that. That even though it's painful, uh, that they still feel the need to eat. So yeah, they're they're. Uh, I would prefer to see more of the psychology and the nutrition addressed so that they can. Uh, manage because it's it's almost like it's not the end of the story it's almost the beginning of the story with the bariatric surgery is that you have to remember to uh eat take your vitamins and stay hydrated and and all of that it take, can take some coordination some thoughts some planning and uh and what you're with such small stomachs what you're going to eat you really want to try to maximize the nutrient value uh and uh so uh, i would like to see 
uh, you know, I, I don't know, I'm not a bariatric surgeon and I'm not in the adult world, but uh, it would be good if that were uh, the case. I kind of, I feel like we almost hear more of the, the, the problems with that. And you don't necessarily hear the uh, stellar bariatric surgeon programs out there that really manage all that and, and help someone uh, keep the weight off and, and help with their mental health like that. But hopefully it's more and more being recognized and, yeah, because we, we all hear the stories about the people who regain the weight or, or this or that, but it might be a little bit of bias mm -hmm. there in what we're hearing. What can parents do to uh, stop uh, the obesity creep in their family from the get-go so their kids don't even have to deal with a weight problem? And I'm thinking about the advice you might give someone who's pregnant. Uh, what could they do to make sure that their kid doesn't start life off with this challenge. Yeah, I'm no expert in pregnancy, but I've heard some great podcasts about this very topic, about um, actually how we're, what a, a woman is eating leading up to and during her pregnancy can influence the, the health uh, of her baby. And even at that epigenetics phenomenon I was talking about, about genes actually being triggered in the baby and uh, the, as the baby grows, how they might impact the, the rest of the life. And, and um, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm not an expert in pregnancy, but uh, I'm a big fan of the plant-based diet and uh, actually helping young families grow and uh, thrive while plant-based. So I think that there is a good role for the plant-based diet uh, just because the foods are so high fiber and uh, high water content, so filling. And in fact, uh, the goal actually for the growing child is um, because they have the smaller stomachs, almost as if they're like a, an adult who's post bariatric surgery, is that you really have to pay attention to what they're eating uh, so that you maximize that nutrient value and maximize the, uh, the amount of nutrition that they're getting in their small stomachs uh, and uh, helping them grow. And it's the plant-based diet is different for a growing child than an adult, for example, who's dealing with obesity or hypertension or diabetes, um, where that's gonna be the whole food, plant-based, no added oil diet, like is recommended by Dr. McDougall and Dr. Campbell and Dr. Eselstein. Um, whereas with a child, um, you might want to have some more oils in there and you might want to have some more processed foods in there uh, just because of that small stomach. I and mean, this is why, uh, this is why kids snack so much is because their stomach fills so quickly that having them eat three meals a day <laughs> is not necessarily going to get them through the day. So they need the snacks because uh, their stomach fills and empties so quickly. And so really giving some thought uh, to what goes in so that you can really maximize their nutrition and help them grow and not have any concerns, I think is uh, what's a little different about the uh, pediatric age group versus the adult age group when talking about the plant-based diet. I had heard, I'd read some really fascinating studies about how, what ha what's happening to a mother, for example, if she's in war time and in, in deprivation and she's pregnant, how the babies mm -hmm. then end up maybe heavier because they're, they're already um, learning yes. to hold on to what food they can get and things like that. So I imagine that, like you said, what the mother eats and how she lives is important to how the baby uh, reacts to food later because of epigenetics. Yes, yes. It's an emerging science. And also the microbiome um, that we're learning about, all the bacteria that are in and on our bodies too, and feeding them the bacteria, healthy foods, plant-based foods, fiber, is all good for a growing child too. Mm -hmm. We, we uh, I was asking you earlier about, you know, you have a family that comes in that's in, in, uh, in strife and, and their, their child's weight is, is creeping up and, you know, maybe they have fast food three times a day, or maybe it's just a standard American diet or whatever it is. And, uh, you eloquently shared that you, you have to, you've got to go pretty deep. You ask them a slew of questions to really understand their lifestyle and what might work for them. But I would love uh, to just get uh, whatever you, you could just tell us a success story if you wanted. But I, I, I'm so curious as to those first steps that you give people. Okay, uh, what, what is this? What might this look like tomorrow or next week? Because they're, they're, they, they've come to you because there's a problem and they want to make some kind of change or fix the problem, I'm assuming, is mostly why any of us go to the doctor. And so how do you 
lovingly take them along the journey. If it is a plant-based diet, uh, what are, what are some of the first foods, the first suggestions, the first meals? Like, uh, yeah. I like to increase the fruit intake, increase the starch intake. Um, I don't focus first on taking foods away or, or, and I really don't like to say you shouldn't eat this. I kind of want to guide them and mentor them through the learning process. Again, finding out what they're interested in. Uh, if they're an athlete, I encourage the Game Changers movie, the documentary. Um, uh, if they want to learn more about the environment, then a movie like Cowspiracy. Um, if they are in a particular I really want to try to get a sense of what their interest is so that I can educate them from that angle, but um, really start by encouraging foods and encouraging filling up on the starches and the beans. Uh, and and I, 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 a lot of people think it's a salad, like, oh, I'm going to eat plant-based, so I'm going to start eating salads. Um, but I don't encourage that because that's a recipe for feeling hungry and weak and tired. And, and uh, I really want to... Uh, uh, give someone the energy to really go out and thrive and be a good representation of what the plant-based diet can do. Um, and then I also, I do give them, you know, it's not all rainbows and unicorns. Uh, you know, I talk to them about, hey, um, you, you might feel uh, pretty bad for a little while because your body's gotten used to a tremendous amount of salt, sugars, and fat. And as we start to as you're crowding out and filling up with these other foods, uh, you're, you might feel a little bad, but you've got to adjust. Your gut is going to have to adjust too. You might be having uh, more poops and more flatulence and things like that uh, as your microbiome adjusts. So I try to try to give them a good expectations. And I tell them uh, really the hardest thing is uh, that you don't have to go out and exercise if you don't want to. You don't have to uh, starve yourself or be hungry. The challenge of eating this way is that you have to be different from everyone else. And I tr really try to work with them on that. You know, you know everyone who's going to be questioning you, where do you get your protein? Where do you get? Uh, and I try to uh, educate them and give them resources so that they have answers to these questions. And what do they do in the social situations? Uh, that's the real hard part of eating this way is is being different from everyone else. And I, again, for some some teenagers, that's an opportunity for them to declare their identity. And for some teenagers, uh, that could be horrifying. Uh, uh, you know, just bringing about a brown bag lunch to the school cafeteria uh, is, you know, horrifying. Uh, so it really depends. Uh, but that's what I'm trying to really support them in being in being different and, and the, their friends and, and possibly even their family. That's the hard part. We had a letter from somebody, a mother who was really at her wits end because her child had an inherited condition that raised his blood pressure. Um, and she was extremely worried that when he was older, unless she started feeding him a, a vegan plant-based diet, um, now that he would get this condition, which his father had and his grandparents had, but he, he doesn't want to do it. He just doesn't. And, um, so she's feeling incredibly guilty that she can't um, implement these. And she also works full time <laughs> and she has other children. And so she's so making special food for him is also a huge stress. Can you give some advice to a parent like that who's dealing with a very calcitrant teenager and also has not very much time to make these changes? Mm -hmm. Who's probably listening because yes, she's listening uh... to every episode. <laughs> uh, yes, um, my my sympathies. Yeah, it it can be hard. If if I had the answer to how to um, manage a teenager to do exactly what a parent wants, I, I <laughs> that would be incredible. Uh, I don't have that answer, but um, yeah, uh, there there's a concept called disenchantment that I really like. Is trying to help someone to achieve dis. You can't force someone to be disenchanted with something. So our food is very enchanting. Right. So that, as I was saying before, all of our senses are geared, the smell of the bacon or the, the look of the cupcake, all of our senses are really geared towards uh, seeking out and getting that high calorie food. We're getting very enchanted. Uh, so what I try to talk to families about is trying to achieve disenchantment. So think about a rose, that a rose is uh, very enchanting, the smell and the uh, thoughts of love and Valentine's Day and stuff. But if you grab the rose, underneath the rose might be thorns. 
Um, so you pause, a person pauses before they grab the rose and think about the thorn. Um, so that's what I try to teach people about is to become disenchanted. So yes, uh, you know, I haven't had bacon in eight years, but the smell still makes my mouth water. But then I know that if I grab the bacon, it has thorns. So it has all the environmental issues and the animal welfare issues and my my health issues. So I, I become disenchanted with the bacon. So that's what I try to help people understand is how to become disenchanted. So if this young man, if there is something uh, that he can uh, be uh, learn about to become disenchanted, that uh, hopefully maybe that would help him uh, break that cycle of wanting those foods that are not good for his health. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that I try to work with on families too. Uh, and again, it's for the moment because uh, you know, no, no teenager is necessarily mm -hmm. concerned about their, their blood pressure uh, it's a very abstract concept uh, that uh, is going to happen, cause problems in decades. But uh, yeah. that is so da -da. powerful. <laughs> I, I, I can't even it, it, a, a very personal, super quick story. I was maybe like vegan for six months or something. And my husband and were out to dinner at a restaurant and I got a salad and I did the like, no bacon, no cheese, you know, so we're in the South. So everything comes with bacon and cheese over lettuce. Uh, and I said all that. And it was, it was, it was a kind of dim, dimly lit, dark restaurant, romantic little place. And the salad came and I started eating it and there weren't any cheese, but I tasted bacon bits, you know, it, real bacon bits. Uh, oh. And I didn't say anything to my husband or to them. And in my head, I was said, oh, this is so delicious. This will be the last <laughs> time. And I, I ate yeah, it because right. I, I had, it was, it was already here. It's already died. It's, you know, the whole thing you go through. And it, okay. So fast forward, I don't know, like 11 years later, like a long time ago then and, and now from then. And something similar happened, not on a salad. I burst into tears the second I tasted it and I spit it all over the, the, the ground. It was outside at like a, an outside event. And I, I mean, I was bawling and that is such an example of disenchantment. You know, by this point I had so much of a, of a heart closeness to what goes on behind closed doors. Um, but I, I guess I'm just sharing that because just to just even, you know, give even more highlights to what you just said, that it's so powerful, that disenchantment, if, if, if you can, you know, take that journey. I, I, th that's a good story. Uh, unfortunate that you had a bacon, but um, another analogy that I'd like to make with the teenager. So for fun, um, I'll ask a teenager, uh, are you saving for retirement? And a lot of them are like, what? I don't even have a job. What are you talking about? And so, so I say, well, like, imagine you had a hundred bucks in your pocket. You could go out tonight and spend it and have a great time, or you can in, save it for retirement. You could put it in some bank or some investment. And then in 50 years, you'll have hopefully a lot of more money. And in, in 50 years, you can go out and, you know, do whatever people in there, you know, at that in 2070 want, want to do for fun uh, because you'll have the money. And I'm like eating healthy today is kind of like saving for retirement, right? So you eat healthy today so that later in life you can do the things you want to do. Sometimes I'm sure that, that doesn't resonate at all with them. No. I, when no. I was a kid, I wouldn't. I'm trying I, to. <laughs> but I mean, maybe. <laughs> an exceptional kid, maybe. I remember when I was, I think I've told this story, when I was in uh, sixth grade, uh, Laura Van Doren, who was a, a very pretty uh, senior in high school, came to our class to talk to us about smoking. Now, we had heard all the nurses stand up and point to those dirty lungs and tell us not to smoke. But when Laura Van Doren said, I quit smoking because my boyfriend said that my mouth tasted like an ashtray when, it, when he kissed me. That had an impact on me. Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. like the prom dress is much more mm -hmm. apt to have an impact. But I, I, I respect that um, you're trying all angles because it's true that different, mm -hmm. different kids will react to different things. You have a telemedicine practice that you started during the, the pandemic to see people from ages 2 to 22, right? Living either in New Jersey or New York. Um, yeah. tell us about 
people are often skeptical of seeing a doctor over video, but I've heard you talk about the advantages actually of uh, having a telemedicine appointment. Right. So uh, the nice thing about obesity is it's not, there's no emergencies. Um, so uh, it's something that's agreeable to telemedicine, but um, what happened was I was doing my pediatric nephrology practice at the hospital and the pediatric obesity practice at the hospital when COVID hit. And my hospital quickly pivoted to telemedicine. So I was driving into work and uh, sitting in front of the computer and working with the families and the families loved it. I mean, there was, there was no driving and traffic. There was no sitting in the waiting room, other people coughing at you, no parking. And for me, I found it helpful also because I got kitchen tours. I'd, uh, you know, say, yeah, you know, show me what's going on in your kitchen. Uh, and people would show me what they had in the fridge. Not that I was catalog everything, but it's interesting, their reaction uh, when I'd ask them as a surprise, would be like, oh, look at all my good fruits and vegetables, Dr. Andrew, or, or oh, I'm not going to show you what's in that drawer. <laughs> um, you know, so it was kind of getting a sense of, of what was going on in the home. So there are really a lot of great benefits um, to doing it. And so that uh, as the, you know, my, I was thinking about expanding my obesity practice and thinking, you know, I could really do this on my own. And uh, yeah, it was in 2021 in the summer of 20, spring, summer of 2021 that I, that I left the hospital job after 16 years to try to pursue this. And I offered two services I offer uh, for the pediatric obesity for families struggling with their weight who want to eat more plant-based and use that angle. Um, and then I also offer a program for the parents uh, who are raising their child vegan, raising their child plant-based, and maybe looking for an, uh, an authority. Or, you know, they go to their pediatrician, the pediatrician says drink milk, and they roll their eyes and uh, they might have questions. So I wanna offer this uh, my expertise to the families that are raising plant-based children. So uh, they can see me in New York and New Jersey. And I also, I recently released a, uh, an e-course, a two hour videos uh, where I really go over um, the new, how to help your child thrive while plant-based, all the aspects. There's a lot of information out there for adults uh, thriving while plant-based, but not a lot for the, the kids. So I really wanted to provide that resource to families. Fantastic. So how can people find you? Oh, I'm on drherbivore.com. Spell out Dr. Herbivore. And uh, you can come see. I actually, I just put up on the website a webinar, 15 minutes, uh, about a boy in my practice who's having two significant health problems from eating too much animal protein. So uh, it was a good story from my practice uh, that uh, really shows an example of how dangerous uh, too much animal protein can be. So there's that free webinar on there and you can learn more about me. All my social media is uh, links are on the website too. So you can come find me and I put out free content on social media and uh, also offer this service in New York and New Jersey. You're awesome on social media. So we just go to your website and on the oh, homepage, we'll be you. able to find that 15 minute webinar. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah, okay. there's there's a link and uh, more about the programs. With with the um, programs, I've also partnered with a plant based chef mm. in my community. She's really great. I'm actually um, she makes dinner. She has like a, a catering oh, service. Awesome. I'm after this. I'm picking up dinner from her mm -hmm. to take home. Um, so she's a she's a professional plant based chef, and uh, so and so virtual cooking classes as part of the obesity. Um, program and also as part of the optimizing a child's uh, nutrition is raising plant based. So um, she'll work with you with a virtual cooking class in your own kitchen. And then I've also partnered with a woman who is a, uh, a youth fitness expert and is plant based. So she'll come online, all this on telemedicine, uh, and she'll do a, you know, a, an assessment of mm -hmm. physical fitness and help you achieve your goals, whether that's more flexibility or more increased strength or conditioning. So she'll work with you uh, over the, the uh, obesity program that I offer too. Uh, I do the blood test, the cheek swab genetic test that I explained. So very comprehensive, very supportive through the process, whether it's with uh, struggling with the obesity or with um, just trying to help plant-based families survive. Uh, or help plant-based families to thrive. And uh, especially for, for all the, uh, I, what I really want to support is for all the omnivore naysayers out there, for, uh, for all the family members and even the pediatricians and friends who are like, oh, it's so dangerous or, oh, uh, you know, what about this protein, iron, as, as uh, often comes up. So I really 
uh, want to help support the family so that they have this uh, knowledge. It's really a knowledge that they can take with them and uh, always ensure that their child is meeting their nutritional needs for growth. Incredible. Fantastic. This has been Thank so you. rich in, in information and Fun. yeah, and sort of just peeling back the layers on the problem and, and very solution oriented. So I know everyone's really going to enjoy this. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Hey folks. Okay. Back by very popular demand is our plant powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free if you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review. Does not need to be long. Does not need to be a whole story. Just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org. And include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review and zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.